Uh, this morning we had some sessions on user safety and disinformation and one of the things that uh, were described really nicely for me is uh, that uh, bad faith actors, when they dislike some information and they want to remove it, uh, they have several options from their perspective. One is of course to try to block the source. Uh, another one is to discredit the source, but also to attack the people who are responsible for the source. And we're here uh, for the third option, attacking the people. Uh, we're here to talk about SLAPS. Uh, SLAPS is a funny, well, funny abbreviation for Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation. Um, in its simplest form, it is when a really powerful company or a very rich personality uh, sues either a journalist uh, or a media or an activist um, it, when they dislike information about them being shared or written about. Uh, quite often, like one of the one of the um, way to recognize uh, a slap lawsuit is that uh, it isn't necessarily intended to win in court, uh, but its main intention is to make sure that the other side, so the journalist or the activist, uh, spends a lot of money, time, and let's say uh, also emotional emotions on this and is uh, therefore distracted from whatever they are or they are doing or writing about or researching about. Um, now I said uh, media organizations, journalists and activists, but um, important uh, for me is that you know that we also have uh, quite a few Wikimedia and Wikipedia cases uh, where either individual Wikipedians uh, or Wikimedia organizations have been slapped. Um, well, one of the recent ones is, and even evil Mr. Wikimedia Estonia is in the room, is uh, from Estonia where uh, there has been a pension reform. Uh, and one of the criticisms of the pension reform was that a very rich businessman is going to benefit from it because of um, his business interests. And this information that was also written about in many uh, media outlets was included in the Wikipedia article and the person strongly disliked it. Uh, and then uh, went to court and basically sued uh, Ivo from Wikimedia Estonia. Uh, if you have questions to him, he is here in the room. I think everything uh, went, uh, like basically the court rejected this case, uh, but still Ivo is stuck with, uh, well, a, a legal bill of a few thousand euros, which is not negligible. Um, and it's uh, certainly not very fair. Um, another case that we have and that is still on, ongoing, uh, now I have no idea how to pronounce Caesar in Portuguese, as I said before, but uh, it is uh, this guy, De Paso, a very rich Portuguese person, and this person also has had some ties to the far-right party in Portugal. Um, this uh, information was included in the Wikipedia article. Uh, the person really disliked that this information is included in the Wikipedia article and sued... Uh, individual uh, users uh, plus uh, the Wikimedia Portugal and then the Wikimedia Foundation stepped in and said basically, hey, sue us instead of all these people, please. <laughs> uh, this, um, um, the case is quite complicated. He also sued uh, a few media companies. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Now, unfortunately, in this case, uh, in the final instance, the Wikimedia Foundation lost. Uh, and the Supreme Court of Portugal said that the information, the inaccurate information needs to be removed, but even more worryingly, uh, it said that the Wikimedia Foundation must give out the personal, uh, the names and the personal data of the users who were editing this article, which the Wikimedia Foundation refuses to do. Um, I cannot go too much into detail what will happen next, uh, just, um, just want to say that this case, the Wikimedia Foundation has not given up on this case and this uh, believes that uh, the Portuguese decision contradicts EU law and is um, checking um, possible ways forward how to escalate this further uh, up the judicial system. But yeah, very worrisome because here uh, the person also wants to basically de-anonymize the users, which of course put our, would put us and our users in a, in a very bad position if this precedent is held up. Um, another case from way back in Italy, there were like two Italian politicians that sued, was it Wikimedia Italia or the foundation? No, actually, it was the foundation. Wikimedia oh, okay, Wikimedia Italia, okay. Uh, for millions and millions, but in the end, uh, basically, the courts uh, rejected the case. Um, this was like 
a positive outcome for us, of course. Uh, what is important for me that we remember just to, to set the scene is that uh, not only media organizations and journalists get slapped, uh, no, Wikipedians and Wikimedians and Wikimedia organizations also regularly get slapped. I presented three cases, but um, the statistics that we could find is that since 2014, uh, there have been 35 to 40 such cases against our movement, uh, out of which about 25 were in the EU, <laughs> uh, which nicely brings us to the topic that uh, my colleague Michele here will talk about uh, today, is uh, the European Union recently uh, passed a anti-slaps directive, which sets uh, minimum safeguards uh, for the protection of journalists and activists against such slap cases. Now, all the EU member states will need to implement it in the next two years and uh, basically want to tell you uh, what's to be expected and what we want out of this implementation. Um, beyond that, this is not just an EU issue, the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe is a larger body. Uh, that includes the UK and Turkey and Ukraine and Switzerland and Bosnia, basically all countries in Europe almost. Uh, they also have recommendations on SLAPs that basically is not about binding, but still recommends their member states to take measures against this. Um, last I've heard, this topic is also being picked up in Brazil by the legislators, so it's not going to stay only in Europe. But we see from the Wikimedia Foundation statistics that most SLAP cases against the Wikimedia movement have been in Europe so far. And with this, I'll pass on to Michele, who will take you through the actual legislation at hand. Hello, thank you, Dimi. Yeah, so uh, as Dimi said, uh, the slabs has been a, a worrisome, worrisome phenomenon. So the European Union last April adopted this directive, which pro protects, introduces protection for persons who engage in public participation uh, from manifestly unfunded claims or abusive court procedure. So this is the so-called anti-slab directive, and uh, but there, there has been also uh, Another another soft law tool that's been adopted at European level in 2022, uh, and this is uh, a recommendation. And I'm mentioning this because if on the one hand the directive is a, a, a legal binding tool, so member states they need to transpose and to achieve the goal, so to introduce these safeguards for those persons that engage in public participation, the the recommendation, legally speaking, is not binding. It's just a guideline, and uh, and and there are differences between the recommendation and, and the directive, uh, meaning that the recommendation has a, a broader scope and uh, uh, asks the member states to, to introduce, for instance, uh, protections also for uh, not only cross-border cases, but also domestic cases. And uh, as Dimi was mentioning, also the Council of Europe in this April adopted a recommendation uh, that again has a, a broader scope uh, and uh, as a paragraph specifically dealing with uh, anonymous public participation and this is uh, quite uh, important for for Wikimedians and Wikipedians because uh, ask member states to introduce safeguards uh, protecting anonymity and we all know that uh, in especially in certain countries anonymity is, uh, is uh, very important so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit more than about like the anti slap directive, and I would like to start with some definitions because the, the, in the directive there is a, a difference between uh, abusive court proceeding against public participations and uh, manifestly unfounded claims. And this distinction is important because uh, abusive court proceedings uh, are those ones that they. Um, where, where, where the, the European legislator foresee the, the more safeguards compared to the manifestly unfounded claim. So what, what, what is it, an abusive court uh, proceeding? It's, it's a claim that uh, an action has been brought not just to uh, generally assert a, a, a right, but to prevent and reduce public participation and uh, normally pursue an, an unfunded claim. Uh, and, and on the other hand, and, and, and so, Abusive uh, court proceeding can be uh, partially or completely uh, unfunded. Um, so then what is it, public participation? Uh, the, in, in the directive, there is a, uh, this, this definition. And uh, so uh, uh, 
it's when normally someone engages in, in an activity that can be uh, the making of a statement or carrying out an activity. So, and this is a, a quite broad uh, definition, meaning that it encompasses the, the possibility where when a Wikipedian writes a, a Wikipedia, uh, an article on, 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 uh, on Wikipedia and this with a, uh, a matter of public interest. And uh, in the directive, there is an explanation, what is it then a matter of public interest? And uh, this is like a, a matter that affects the public to such an extent that the public has an interest in, in, uh, in it, such as, I don't know, arguments like uh, an environment, climate change on the exercise of like fundamental rights or freedom of expression or activity of, of public figures or allegation of, uh, of corruptions or fraud. And uh, so this is quite broad again, uh, because the, the goal of the directive is like to encompass the, uh, a quite broad so, um, activities and not protecting just journalists or media organizations that normally are supposed to be uh, slap targets. So the scope of the directive, um, because uh, it's very important, because the, the, the European Union has a, a limited competence, uh, and which is established in the, in the European treaties. So uh, a matter to be covered by the directive, so to be within the material scope, uh, has to be a civil or commercial claim. So there are, and, and has to be, has to, to have like a cross-border dimension because the European Union doesn't have any competence on uh, or criminal or administrative law. And, uh, and so this is, as I was like mentioning before, a, a huge difference between the recommendations and the directive because of, of these limitations. So the, the both recommendations have a broader scope and, uh, and, the, and the directive is just limited to uh, to this civil and, and commercial and commercial matters and uh, with regard to the personal scope as i said the the, the protection are for you see, not only for for the journalists the media organization but uh, the directive talks about uh, natural or legal person who engage in public participation so this is very broad so it could be a journalist, even though there is no definition of journalist, what is a, a journalist in the directive. Again, this is done on purpose. And it could be activists and, and uh, human rights defenders. And uh, but, so it's quite broad. And of course, Wikipedians fall within, within the, the personal scope of the directive. So the directive, as Dimi pointed out, uh, establishes just minimum requirements, which means that member states need to adopt a legislation that, I mean, with, with, the, with the minimum safeguards, but they can go much farther. And this is actually something that for us is very important because in the next activity, we will focus on the transposition of the directive. And uh, there, member states, as the directive points out, may, so they're not obliged, but they can go much farther. And another very important aspect of this Article 3 is like that member states, they cannot use this directive as an excuse to damage the protection that they already have in place. And because some members said they already have like some rules protecting like uh, activists or journalists. And so this is cannot be an excuse to, for some governments to, to say, okay, now we have this directive, we're going to change our, our rules and, and so diminish the, 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 the protections. So well, what are these, these, uh, these protections? With Wikimedia Europe, we engaged with uh, with a coalition which is called CASE, which is a coalition against labs in Europe, and there were like uh, three main points. So the first one was like uh, the introduction of this uh, early dismissal mechanism. So the directive for a C that for manifestly unfunded claims, slab targets can can submit and a request to to have like an early dismissal mechanism. And, uh, and, uh, and this is very important because this early dismissal mechanism can have a, a deterrent effect. So um, people who have like uh, uh, lots of power and they want to sue someone, they can be in a way scared. And so they could decide in the end not to carry out this, this legal claim. The second aspect is like this cross-border dimension. Do, during the adoption of the directive, this has been changed and now there is a presumption that a matter has a cross-border dimension, except 
if the both parties of the of the of the lawsuit are, are domiciled in the same member state as the court sized or and if all other relevant uh, elements are like located in the same member states and this is um, left to the appreciation of of the judge case by case and uh, but this is quite again uh, a broad definition and this is good because uh, otherwise there is no protection if, the, if it's not proved this cross-border dimension there is no um, possible protection and the third one is like the compensation of uh, of damages which uh, with compensation of damages are referred to 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 different types of things so the first one is like that the defendant can ask for the full award of cost proceedings and, uh, and on the other hand that, that could be if it's for a sin in, in the in the national law uh, it could also ask for damages so if someone sues me and then in the end lost i can ask for being compensated with with the damages that i that i suffered that can be material but also immaterial damages and then the directive or is he also uh, a, a, a lot of other all other uh, uh, other protections so for instance the the defendant can ask for for a for a security meaning that uh, uh, he can ask if to 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 the client that he has to to deposit some money to cover like the cost and possibly also the damages so this is also introduced to a, a, a deterrent effect then there is like this um, rule which establishes that if the climate at one moment withdraw or like amend his claim this is doesn't even uh, affect the 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 defendant that can still apply for the protection of the forest in the in the directive and this is has been introduced because what happened and normally happens in several cases is like that then the climate put forward like a, a claim it modifies and then the defendant that initially suffered possibly also some damages is like left alone with no protection so in this case no and uh, the third element is like that uh, also other association can join the the defendant and can help him in the during during the process so also this point is uh, is very important and uh, so then there are like uh, i would like to point out to point number six that I think that is very relevant for for Wikimedia Wikipedia so the directive for the possibility to uh, refuse for a court the recognition and enforcement of a uh, of a third country decision that if that case had been brought before a European court would have like amount to a uh, abusive uh, proceeding and uh, at the same time gives the possibility for the for the slap target to ask for uh, again uh, compensation both of the costs that suffered before like the third country court and also for 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 damages so this is these are like the main points of like the directive and um, i would like now to to talk a little bit about like the transposition phase because as i said before we are going to focus in the next two years the directive needs to be transposed within two years so uh, it's May 2026, and uh, we are going to focus on, on on some points. As I said, like the, the the early dismissal mechanism is not automatic, so it's the appreciation of the judge when the the slap target asks for an early dismissal to evaluate case by case. But this is, in our view, shouldn't be the case. Is if prima facie the the defendant can prove that there is no ground for the claim, the judge should. Uh, uh, grant this early dismissal, the early dismissal mechanism. There should be also the halt of the of the main proceeding because this is also another important point. Then there is the definition of cross-border di dimension. As I was explaining before, the European Union has a, a limited competence, so there should be this cross-border dimension. But as I mentioned, as I previously mentioned, the the, the recommendation adopted by the European Commission ask the member states to provide for the same safeguards also for for domestic cases so this is for us another important aspect because also domestic cases should have like the same level of, of protection and then in the end there is uh, um, there is the point number three that uh, says like that the 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 court 
could also uh, take by ex officio, so um, by its own initiative, the possibility to 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 award like the some some safeguards. But this is just a possibility. It's not it's not mandatory for member states when they will transpose the directive to to have such a rule and. This is quite also important, so it should be there in every member state legislation. And then in the end, there is like the the, the possibility to 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 ask for uh, damages. Again, this was like a very controversial point when then the directive was like negotiated, and member states they didn't want because they're like very jealous of, of their jurisdiction. And uh, so now the directive say that that the, the defendant can ask for damages if the the national law provides so, which means that it's just a possibility. And again, this is a ver another very important point that, in, you know, if the if the lab target can ask for damages, this is uh, a very powerful tool because then the the claimant will think twice, <laughs> no, to 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 sue someone if then knows that you know you can ask back damages, especially when they ask you for. Millions of euros, as was the case for the uh, Italian, yeah, that were like the Angelucci brothers asked for 20 millions of euros, so it was like very, very much. So, uh, as I was like saying, yes, here we are, and uh, yeah, then that's it. I thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, please, we're here. Yeah. Uh, so just to wrap it up, um, we have in the next few years, there will be many countries across Europe, but also outside of Europe that will be working on anti slap legislation. Uh, we would like to have better damages, early dismissal mechanisms and proper ones, uh, and uh, a good definition of cross-border cases. So just like to put it into your heads. If you ever come across something like this and you want to work on this, please reach out to us and then we can basically prepare everything for you and then you can go and advocate in your country. Uh, I just want to like uh, say um, an honorable mention. Ivo is here. Ivo is the Estonian guy who got his, uh, well, who was sued in, in Estonia. So, yeah. Yeah, he won. Uh, but uh, did you <laughs> did you get your money back, or well? Yes, in the end, I didn't need to pay anything. Uh, but uh, we assume that the uh, person who sued me had cost at least ten thousand euros related to just suing me. <laughs> um, is there anybody who wants to? Thank you. Um, I have a question about the cross-border dimension. Isn't the fact that uh, Wikipedia is based uh, abroad uh, enough to grant the cross-border di dimension in a case involving Wikipedia or not? Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, I think <laughs> it, it depends. It depends on the on the concrete case. But yes, I mean, yeah. But the cross-border dimension, I'm, it's within the EU. Okay, so so since it is based in the U.S., maybe it's not okay. So if it's a third country, it's not. Uh, if a French but person, if a French person sues us from Italy, it's it's a problem. But uh, we do work to want we do want to work with you on this definitely for the transposition. And do you think <coughs> there is also scope uh, for um, Working also on the criminal part, or it's out of discussion. No, no. Of, of course, it's, it is very important because, as I said, the directive because the the European Union has a, this limited competence on just on civil matters with cross border dimension is limited to that. But of course, lots of like slap cases are based on defamation, and uh, normally defamation, yeah, it shouldn't be should be decriminalized and uh, should be very targeted because it can affect freedom of expression and yeah and and also it can be also some administrative law cases as well also when the the public power exercise the, their their power can be also another way to slap someone so yes when we're going to work at a national level of course these two uh, criminal law and administrative law should be in 
Uh, are there any concrete plans on how to make sure that we have an extremely excellent Wikipedia article about uh, what is a slap and to make sure that it's uh, present in as many European languages as possible? Because as well, we know that in the next two years, a lot of uh, state officials are probably going to Google what exactly a slap is and that kind of information that uh, comes up in the search probably might uh, change on what they, how they actually behave or what kind of, how, how they view this topic? Well, let's make a concrete, concrete plan with you right now. I mean, let's come together over lunch tomorrow and decide what we do. I assume we need uh, Wikipedia articles on slaps in 24 or 5 languages that are well written. Uh, that would be a good start. Do we have a last question? Anyone? Now it's the chance to ask the experts. Um, not, not a concrete question, but I was wondering um, these laws against defamation um, are sometimes needed to protect Wikipedians um, against defamation on off wiki sites. And um, I, I wasn't able to uh, formulate a question out of this, but um, I think there's a need to balance. Um, allowing everyone to say everything online about everyone and um, preventing this from being misused. Yes, I mean, I, I think every single country that I can think of has some rules or laws against defamation or similar. And from my perspective, it's important to have such rules because otherwise anybody can really drag anybody else through the mud and that's also not okay. I definitely agree. Of course, you need like some protection, but he, well, maybe I was not clear before. But what it shouldn't be the case is like you know in certain countries like defamation uh, is uh, is a crime, so they can you can get arrested and put in jail. So what we think this is shouldn't be the case, you know. Even if there is like criminal law, there should be just a fine, no, you know, a sentence to jail. <laughs> Yeah, but but just like there is, let's let just just to clarify this. There is no official Wikimedia position on whether defamation should be a crime or not. Like we're not advocating on that. Thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause for our speakers, please? Thank you. Yeah.